Thank you all for joining us. I want to start off with a quick survey, which is how many folks here are working today on tackling the climate crisis? If you show of hands, perfect. This is wonderful. And then I guess for the rest, how many of you here hope we avert this climate crisis? Does that get us everybody? OK, good. Wonderful, wonderful. Helpful, yes, yeah. So I'm an engineer, and I actually absolutely loved Frank Luntz's talk that happened before this. If folks saw it, it's not what you say, it's what people hear, right? He's pushing us to use messaging that is stronger, that moves people to take action. But like I said, as uh, I'm an engineer, and this track here is a deep dive on net zero, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the numbers, into the actual substance behind the problem of what we have to actually turn off to get to this world of carbon neutrality or net zero. And in doing that, I think we have to first ask, why do we have a climate crisis? Well, it's because we have an emissions crisis. To do all of the things that we love and enjoy, which is powering our cities, moving around in vehicles, in vehicles, in vehicles. <laughs> oh, do we not have? Oh, I'll give it a sec. Aha. We have an emissions crisis because to enjoy all the things that we do, from powering our cities, to moving around in vehicles, to flying. I'm struggling here, I'm sorry, guys. That's all right, let's pause and get the slides to work. Slides. I have a lot of slides with lots of good numbers to. Oh, there you go. <laughs> to fly. So the thing, <laughs> I, I think actually taking this elongated point on this point is really important. These are the things we truly enjoy doing. They're the things that connect us with other people. They're the things that really get us around to move. So to drive, to fly, to cook, to bring people together, to warm and cool the buildings that we're in, to build the buildings that we're in, as well as the bridges and roads that we take every single day, we burn fossil fuels. Like I said, an engineer, we're going to nerd out just a little bit. This is a flow diagram of all the carbon emissions in the United States and the source of uh, fuel that they come from. You can see in the blue, you've got natural gas, which is primarily used for electricity generation, as well as heating for both homes and industry. You can see that coal, primarily used for electricity, and then petroleum for transportation, moving us around. These are the drivers of our emissions crisis. And we pick these fuels because they're quite dense and quite amazing with the ability we can just put them into cars, transport them by rail, but we extract them from Earth, right? Coal comes from fossilized plants. Oil and gas comes from fossilized plankton. There are no dinosaurs in our fuel. There's just a lot of other fossilized things. And what we do is we actually burn them to produce heat which produces steam, which helps us move motors, and really creates all the things that we do to move and live today. The challenge is, with burning these fossil fuels, we release greenhouse gases. And the greenhouse gas culprit number one, of course, is carbon dioxide, but there are many more that are actually quite worse, like methane, nitrous oxide, and industrial gases. And we need some of these in the atmosphere, right? It's why we get to enjoy the world we have today but we have emitted far too much. Since the Industrial Revolution, 1850s, we've emitted close to 2.3 trillion tons of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. That's 1,000 gigatons. That is a, a trillion. Yep, 2.3, uh, sorry, 2,300 gigatons. And we've done the most, most of that in the past 30 years, which is mind-boggling, right? So for anybody that's in their 20s, 30s, and above, we have been part of this emissions crisis. And the thing is, when you look at uh, this problem, I think it's really helpful to understand what a gigaton looks like, right? So today we emit 59 gigatons, 59 billion tons of emissions. And so trying to tackle this, what does a gigaton look like? Well, a gigaton is 215 million vehicles. If we find a way to take 215 million vehicles off the road through electric, electric vehicles or through other mode transportation shifts, we've removed a gigaton. If we find a way to remove 268 coal plants, we've removed a gigaton. If we find a way to stop seven million acres of forest being burned, we've removed a gigaton. 
And for scale, we burn close to 24 million acres of forest each year around the world. 115 million cows is also a gigaton of emissions. And so when we think about trying to tackle this problem of gigatons, these are where they are and this is where it adds up. You can see the 59 comes from the energy sector, the industry sector, agriculture, transportation, and nature, which is really land use change. So for these 59 tons that we emit, well, the IPCC has kind of reminded us in this latest IPCC report, we've got 400 gigatons to go to keep within that one and a half degree limit. Remember that 2.3 trillion, sorry, 2 point, yeah, 2.3 trillion tons emitted? That's that first bar at the bottom of that. That's what's contributed to the 1.1 degrees of warming that we experience today. You add that 400 to this chart, that's what gets us to that one and a half mark. And at the pace we're going today, we're gonna blow through this budget in less than eight years. And to be quite honest, we're gonna blow through the 1.7 budget as well as the 2.0. And what's incredibly alarming is that we are quite on track with the policies that are being taken today as well as the pace of deployment towards a three degree world. And that's already double the temperature that the leading scientists around the world say that we have to hit, which is 1.5 degrees. And so what do we do? What is the plan to remove these emissions, right? If we take what Frank said, we gotta move people to act, but what are we gonna move them to act towards? What is the plan? And for that, I'm gonna invite the chairman of Kleiner Perkins, a pioneer clean tech investor, the person that got me into this fight, as well as the co-author of Speed and Scale, John Doerr. Thank you. What is the plan? We need a plan. There's been great work done on climate for decades, lots and lots of goals. Not enough efforts to make sure that the goals all add up, and that they're measurable and specific and accountable and time-bound. So that's what Speed and Scale is. You may think it's a book, decidedly not a book. It's a plan masquerading as a book. And for those of us live in the audience, there's a copy of this book waiting for you right outside the auditorium. Uh, for many of you inside the auditorium, there's an infographic. And I'd like to say to everyone online, you can go to www.speedandscale.com and you can download the plan for free. This is it. 10 great, big, gorgeous objectives supported by 55 magnificent, measurable key results. We'll hear more about those in a minute, but I encourage you in the audience to open up this plan, pull it out, because we'll be referring to it. This plan is based on a proven goal setting system from uh, one of my longtime mentors, and more importantly, probably the greatest manager of his generation, and that's Dr. Andy Grove of Intel. And he had the problem of trying to make microchips 10 thousandths of a meter wide, one micron wide, exactly right, and get thousands of people to do that at Intel all at once, or nothing worked at all. And so he came up with a system for setting, Jim Collins would call them, big, hairy, audacious goals, EHAGs, and then supporting them with specific, measurable, aggressive, ambitious key results. It turns out, if you have your poster handy, there are six big solutions. Electrified transportation, which means power all of our vehicles with electricity and batteries. The second is to decarbonize the grid by using solar, wind, and safe nuclear wherever we can to generate clean electricity. The third is to fix our food system. And that means eating less meat and dairy voluntarily, wasting less food, and improving our soil health, how we grow the food around the world. Remember, this is a global plan. This is not a US plan. Importantly, num number four is to protect nature. That's our oceans and forests, also our wetlands and grasslands. And then five, perhaps the hardest of all these, is to clean up industry. That's how we make cement, how we make steel. Ingredients, materials that are fundamental to civilization and our planet, but that in the very nature of how they're made today, cause us to emit carbon. 
So when I see somebody who tells me they've got a plan for fixing global warming, I like to ask them, what's your plan for concrete? Because that's where, if you'll pardon the pun, the rubber meets the road. There's a sixth category, though, and that's called removal of carbon. No matter how good we are at those first five emissions reductions, there will remain stubborn carbon emissions. And the latest IPCC report said we're going to have to take at least a gigaton per year out of the 59 through mechanical means. This is often referred to as direct air capture. And we need natural means, like planting more trees, to help us get to our goal of 59 to zero. The hardest part of all of this, though, isn't getting to zero. It's that we've got to get there fast. We've got to get to net zero by 2030, and importantly, get halfway there in the next seven and a half years by 2030. Brian, is that feasible? I hope so. So when we put together the book and spend time with maybe close to 100 different activists, scientists, entrepreneurs, and founders, right? They, they laid out the solutions that John talked about, right? The one through six. But they also put forth the accelerants that we can pull on, right? The things to make this transition to go faster. And they're all on an equal pedestal. We've got to win the policy and politics so the commitments that are made publicly actually have laws that follow through them. We've got to turn movements into action. So that means everything from the ballot box, getting people elected, to the boardroom to make the commitments that matter earlier, right? 2030, 2040 targets. We've got to innovate to drive down the cost of clean energy, and then we've got to invest like our lives depend on it. That's investing in R&D, investing in venture capital, project finance, as well as philanthropic dollars. And so this is how you get from 59 to zero a lot faster. John, you're gonna dig us into one of these examples here. Yeah, a bunch of talk, I wanna get real here. Uh, let's pick one of the objectives. I'm, I'm going to choose, if you have your, your folder in front of you, it's number one, electrified transportation. If we succeed at this, we're going to take eight gigatons a year down to two gigatons in the next 30 years, from eight to two. And as a perfect example of one of six measurable key results, key result number 1.1 says, electric vehicles must achieve price performance parity with new internal combustion engine vehicles in the US by 2024. That's just two years from now. And that means a $35,000 average selling price. The average selling price of an electric vehicle in the US today is nowhere near that. It's nearer to fifty dollars to $60,000. So we've got real work to do to get this done. If we achieve that in the US, though, we're only partway to our goal. Because we call out by 2024, these vehicles need to cost excuse me, by 2030, in India and China, they need to cost $11,000 per vehicle. Pretty tall order to achieve. Another key result, key result number 1.2, says for cars, one of every two new personal vehicles purchased worldwide must be EVs by 2030. That's in just seven years. And 95% of them by 2040. I want to tell you how we're doing on that one. We're actually making great progress. A year ago, just 3% of the cars sold were electric vehicles. Last year, it skyrocketed in one year's time to 10%, with over half of those coming from China. So you, you can see that these uh, key results will allow us to track our progress and see if we're on track and make mid-course corrections along the way. What's special about these OKRs, I mean, actually, could you quickly do a quick survey again? How many folks have used OKRs before? Good, excellent. And so you can see how it points us towards how we know if we're successful at the objective. That's what's really key. But it's still going to take a world of ingenuity and a world of effort to actually do the things to get that done. I wanted to do a quick survey here of the room, which was, which one of these objectives are you working on? Which ones of these are you supporting? And actually expecting for many of you to keep your hand up for a couple of them. And so as I read them out, it'd be wonderful to see this room come to life on who here is working on electrified transportation? For your personal use or your business? It's okay. Yeah. Decarbonizing the grid? Who's participating on actions in that? Amazing. Fixing food? Perfect. Protecting nature? 
AKA ending deforestation. It's kind of the simple cleanup industry. It's gonna be the hard one. Removing carbon, any carbon removal folks here? Fantastic, and then the accelerants that you're pulling on, who focuses on politics and policy? He's the man. How about movement building? Where are my activists? I think everybody should raise their hand on that one. I think we all have a lot of uh, innovation. And then investment. Perfect. We have all the levers. We have all the people that are working towards these solutions. John, we've got something to announce as well, too, while we're here. Something new that we're going to announce tomorrow on Squawkbox is that the speed and scale plan, which I told you is not a book, it's a plan, masquerading as a book, is going to flip from a website describing the plan into an action tracker so that anyone can follow the progress of the world or their group in uh, pretty much near real time against these various goals. And so I want to show you how it works. You'll, you'll see every single person can understand where we stand today, and it provides information that will help you hold folks accountable. So if you go on the website to the action tracker, you'll see that, well, you can type in code red as an example, and it, it will pull up how alarming some of these key results are. For over 10 of them, we're going in the wrong direction at the multi-gigaton level. For methane emissions, for example, we leaked, vented, and flared 2.4 gigatons of methane just last year. And that's wasteful. There's no reason to do that. There's no economic justification for it. That number is expected to have increased in 2021. But it's not all code red. So the code red is where the attention, the collective actions, when you're thinking about mobilizing people where to spend your time on, these are the places. But the tracker also shows places where progress is being made, right? Like this one, where there's strong momentum. The price of lithium ion batteries has dropped. Production keeps on rising. There are other KRs like this that John talked about earlier, right? We're not on track anymore for the price parity piece. We were actually at the end of last year. This was marked as having momentum because prices were going down. But then because of supply chain issues, the price of lithium ion has gone up for, for the battery piece, but just the whole EV sector as a whole. The plan also, sorry, the tracker as well, pulls out some neat things like, well, what cars are for sale in the US? And what range do they have? How much do they cost? We also track things like this, like which businesses in the Fortune 500 have a strong commitment towards net zero or carbon neutrality by 2040. And what you can do with this is actually go company by company. And if you're an employee or an activist, push the leaders there to take stronger action and to do it more publicly. And we also launched, are launching another piece too. Called the Action Guide. This book, this plan, it's been out for six months, would you say? Mm -hmm. The most common question we get at the end of a review of it is, so what can I do? What can individuals do? What can their companies do? And what's neat about answering that question is we kind of just go back to those objectives, but frame it in, what can I do today in 2022 with a shorter term goal of what can I do to cut emissions in half? by 2030, right? Like I have this belief if the US and Europe can truly cut its emissions in half by 2030, the world will follow. And so in the areas of what you can do, if it's switching to an EV, getting on a clean energy plan with your utility, as well as leading, eating less beef. When you think about what your company can do, it's about demanding and really procuring clean energy once again. It also is about electrifying fleets by 2030. It's impossible to buy even 25 electric trucks right now, but putting together a plan by 2030 to electrify all fleets, that's doable, as well as working on lowering the footprint of packaging. For cities, there's a lot of power in there. You are the number one constituent of your utility. Demand more from them. Get gas out of buildings, as well as build protected bike lanes that get people out of fossil fuel vehicles faster. And so this action guide does it for state and federal governments as well, too, but really tries to tie things up on what can I do today. I want to emphasize the importance of local leaders. I probably get an email twice a month from Greg Postman about some initiative <laughs> that he's driving here in the Roaring Fork Valley to electrify transportation or to change, change food patterns. Our ability to vote and to make this climate crisis a top two voting issue is the most 
powerful single thing that we can do. It's expected that we'll put solar panels on homes and move to electric vehicles around the world. Those are necessary, but they're not going to win the day. It's going to be the leadership of each of you in your own venues of power to move others to action that will get us over the finish line. So right now, we're actually going to shift to a Q&A format. And I actually really want to encourage the room to start asking questions as I get a few going. And there will be two mics in the room. And to kick off this portion, uh, inviting, of course, Hal Harvey to join us as well, an incredible policy leader around the world, a trusted advisor to many presidents around the world, as well as upcoming author of The Big Fix, which is a book that everyone should be able to grab on their way out. There's a whole handful of books that are there. And Hal, I love The Big Fix. I love that it points people towards the collective actions that we have to take. It has an incredibly memorable opening sentence to the book. And it goes as follows. Our world is on fire. The flames are hard to see because we hide them so well, but you can hear them. They're jet aircraft everywhere. Everywhere we turn, we're burning things up to have a better living. And understanding how we can move from burning carbon to other ways of getting energy is what's crucial. And it's not just a matter of Hal's taught us technology fixes or bright, shiny objects, but most importantly, going for the gigatons and getting the policies right. So I just have to ask you to do this. Join me in a round of applause for Ad Ad Aspen's native son. So, so normally the uh, applause follows of the talk. And I like the inversion because I'm done. I didn't screw up this one. Um, actually, I can, as you may see. First of all, thank you, John. Thank you, Ryan. Um, terrific uh, opening. And great to be your partners in, in putting these plans together. Um, if you really pay attention to this number of 59 gigatons, the global emissions of greenhouse gases per year, and you realize where they come from, it's a daunting problem. Ah. I just try again how they might have raised it up. Um, I'll speak loudly, but maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, you know. It's working, but bring it closer. Well, it's, it's, oh, here we go. Okay. I told you I could screw this up. <laughs> so can you hear me now okay? Yeah. So if you, if you really want to get to this 59 gigatons, you have to dig into some very big systems because it's our cars, it's our buildings, it's our factories. It's, it's everything we do. It's the big, heavy, physical stuff in the economy. This is not a digital revolution. This is a new industrial revolution that we have to master. So if you want to make a big difference, you need to do, a, I would say, four steps. The first one is to understand where the biggest emissions reductions are, where the biggest emissions are. That seems trivial, um, and in some ways it is. You can find that in John's book, John and Ryan's book right here. But you'd be amazed at how many people work in this field who actually don't do that first bit of crucial homework. The second thing you have to understand is what actions would decarbonize that system? So let's choose the electric utility grid. What, what, what are the options we have available? And I can, I can argue with evidence that we can, de we can reduce carbon emissions from the grid by 80% by 2030 to 2035. A huge number, and back it up. So the first point is to have the sources with how many zeros are on it. The second one is which the specific strategy to reduce it. The third question you have to ask yourself is who decides? And this is really important too, because most people say write your senator. Well, <laughs> if we have to put all our hopes on that, we're screwed, right? <laughs> and it's usually not your senator who makes these decisions. You know, states decide building codes and utility regulations, and often automobile standards, and often appliance and equipment standards, and the layout of roads and cities. None of that happens in Washington. Washington doesn't make that many decisions related to our energy and climate future. So you have to understand who makes the decision. And then once you know that, you get to the fourth and final point. You design your intervention around that. If you know who makes the decision, you can begin to understand what are the arguments pro and con that are going to arise here. And this all sounds pretty simple. It turns out it requires some hard work. But the rewards are fantastic because it means your efforts mean something. 
It's not just noise. Let me give one quick example. Please. Um, it only makes sense to have one set of pipes and one set of wires going into each house. It's a physical monopoly. You don't want two sets of wires coming into your house. It makes no sense. Since it's a physical monopoly, there are regulators, because otherwise they could price gouge you, and God forbid that, <laughs> as we're sitting in this energy crisis. So how do, when you write your check for your utility bill each month, does that money land on coal or on natural gas or on wind or on solar? Who decides that? And it is these regulatory bodies that every state has. Every state has a public utilities commission. And the thing we have to do is put the public back into the public utilities commission. So let's do a little bit of uh, intervention math here. There's 50 states in America. They each have about five commissioners. So that's 250 people control 40% of our greenhouse gases because they control the grid and they control natural gas. 250 people. But we're going for the big numbers, right? So we're going to chop off the 20, 20 littlest states. So we're down to a much smaller number. And you don't have to win every vote by 5 to 0. You can win them by 3 to 2. The upshot is there are 90 people that control almost 40% of the carbon emissions. 90 people in America. Who are those 90 people? What's their job? What's their statutory authority? Who's listening to them? How do you affect their choices, which are, in fact, going to de determine where your utility bill goes. And the way you do that is you look at the venue in which they operate and you master that venue. So utility regulatory forms are quite similar to judicial forms. They have a calendar, they have a docket, they have uh, boundaries set by legislation. You can intervene in them. They are required to listen to the public. They're required to answer against interventions. If you do this steadily, and it's, it's hard work, it's an involved thing, but you can flip the utilities from being the biggest enemy to the biggest friend. How many have been flipped? There's about 30 now in America that have specific, tangible, legally required require, uh, legal requirements for increasing clean energy. And they're going pretty quick. California is going to be decarbonized by 2045, but they're already 67% of the way there. It's the biggest state in America. It's one of the biggest economies that's actually on the path. That took you know, 10 years, 12 years of advocacy, probably costing one to two million bucks a year, but the real value is the individuals who showed up at these hearings. So this is what we have to do. You have to dig into the system. You have to understand who makes the decision. Then you have to design an intervention that's gonna affect them. When you do that, I call this a precision intervention, then you make amazing progress. It's not as, it's a little more complicated than writing a letter, but it's a hell of a lot more rewarding. So how with these precision interventions, and John, this question for both of you, right? The IPCC says we have to cut emissions in half by 2030. Is that a plausible target? It's a tough target, but it's a plausible target. Um, there are, and it'll be harder with concrete and steel than it is with the grid. But if you start with the grid and pursue that fast, it enables everything else. Because if you have a decarbonized grid, Running an electric car, you have a decarbonized car. Yeah. Running an electric building, you have a decarbonized building. So it has, and, in, and there's many, many options in the industrial sector as well. So it has plenipotentiary power. I'd respond that it's possible. The plan shows a way to get there. But it's not likely. We are not on track to cut emissions in half in the next seven and a half years. They went up 6% last year. Most forecasts are they're going to go up this year. They've got to go down 8% per year for the next compounded to get a 50% reduction. But it can be done. We have a plan. Where do we see successful efforts, though? Because, John, that's the real, that is the true point of view of how hard it's going to be, but how in your book you introduce this concept of the learning rate. It's something we can lean on. Like, give us some hope Perfect. with this learning rate. So um, light bulbs. We've all heard this story. They've, they've decreased in price 95% in the last 10 years. Solar cells have decreased, solar panels have decreased in price by 90% in the last 10 years. Wind has decreased in price by 60% in the last 10 years. What's happening is the more of these things we build, the more innovation we produce, the cheaper it is to save the, save the world. And I sometimes say it is now cheaper to save the world than to ruin it. It doesn't mean we're done inventing things, but we, really have to deploy, and this gets back to John and Ryan's book, Speed and Scale. If we don't move quickly, there's no way to fit 
this poor, bedraggled earth into a reasonable future. And so you can have all the inventiveness and all the dreams about the long-term future technologies. It doesn't matter if we don't win the short term, right? Because it's a fixed budget we're working against. If you look at the, the advances I mentioned, plus those in lithium ion batteries and electric cars and so on, it becomes quite clear that we can get to this 50% reduction number in time. Um, and I'll give you one more ray of hope. China will install over 100 uh, gigawatts of solar this year alone. That's more than the rest of the world combined through all history. Uh, and China, when China decides to do something, a lot happens. Um, there are obstacles, there are problems. Um, I recognize them. I think I did something horrible in a previous life for which I'm paying now by having made 70 trips to China. And, I, and I've got more in my future if we ever open up again. Um, but China's run by engineers. They understand the climate problem. They don't treat it as a political issue. And they're taking serious steps. They're also burning more coal than any country on planet Earth. Right? So you can't be naive about this. The transition is going to be hard. And adding more coal. And adding more coal. Um, net the additions are close to zero, I'm happy to say, because they're turning off a lot of power plants. That's great to hear. John, how do we navigate that? China is the number one emitter today. What is the role of the US? What is the role of Europe? What's the role of China? What's your point of view on each of these world leaders? Well, my view is the United States has to go first. And that's uh, partly because of how I got into this. My 16-year-old daughter, Mary Doerr, after seeing Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth over the dinner table, uh, yelled at me in the midst of my friends, saying, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem. You better fix it. That was 15 years ago. I had no idea what to say or what to do, so I set out with I met Hal Harvey with the advice of experts and my partners and friends, traveled the world to try to figure out what could be done. And over the course of three venture capital funds, eight or so years, we invested a billion dollars in 70 or so clean tech startups, we call them green tech. Most of them failed. Many of them were crushed by policies and investments from China. But a few hung on and delivered smart thermostats. And residentially installed solar solutions and uh, protein-based meats, microinverters, those had billion, turned out not to be a washout. They're worth some $3 billion today. But more important than the dollars was the lessons that were learned that applied to this generation of, of, of innovations. And, and so I, I think my generation, since that conversation with Mary, has not solved this problem. And what I say to her today, because she's still angry and she's still scared, is that both of our generations are going to be required to pull together to tackle this problem. We're going to need all hands on deck. We're going to need smart policy, as well as inventions that will lower the cost, what our friend Bill Gates calls the green premium. You said the word cost, the cost of the transition. What's the opportunity there? I, my take on it, I'm interested in what Hal thinks, is this is the greatest opportunity of the 21st century. Think about it. We're going to transform the entire economy from one dependent on burning fossil fuels, often from petro dictatorships, into relying on the clean, limitless, abundant sources of sunlight and wind onshore and offshore, and, and, and natural systems which can can scale and heal. So I think the IEA has estimated that it's going to take $4 trillion a year for 30 or 40 years to fund this energy transition. And the good news is we're spending about that much right now on fossil fuel solutions. So one view is that all we need to do is shift where those dollars are going. The other view is that that shift, this clean energy revolution, uh, the gain for the innovator, the nations that choose to lead, is going to be the loss for the incumbents and the fossil fuel interests. And they're going to fight like crazy to defend that economic agenda. So this is not just inventing a new kind of search engine for the internet. You've got to displace 
a lot of long established human behavior with powerful economics behind it. Hal? So, <clears throat> can I take a quick detour and talk about each of the four key sectors? And yeah, please. What are the intervention points? Just to, just to put some specificity on this. So, um, I started with a grid and I argued that you can cut, uh, you can go to 80% clean energy by 2030 or 2035. Uh, this has been proven in a lot of jurisdictions around the world already, and you can do it with increasing reliability and decreasing costs. It requires a hell of a lot of solar, a lot of onshore wind, a lot of offshore wind, and then it requires systems to balance it all. Um, but this has been done in incredible detail by utility planners. The decision makers are these public utilities commissioners that I mentioned, and they have to listen to you. They're required by law to pay attention to and consider your arguments. So that's one, one element, but let me quickly do a couple others. Please. If you have a clean grid and you have an electric car, you have a clean car, voila. Um, but we have to start now. We can't wait till the grid is perfect. So what does this mean? It means you, the next car you buy better be an electric car. Um, but it also means we need to get up to speed and scale. We need to start turning fleets over, school buses, utility trucks, garbage trucks. All those vehicles that run all day long in our towns and cities need to be flipped to electric. And this can be done with a be beginning with incentives followed by mandates. The incentives should decline over time, the mandates should increase over time, and that way there's a rush to the gates. People want to get there first. And who decides this? Well, that's where the federal budget comes in because of the incentives, but also the states can do this. And if you get, look again, there are now 13 states that have followed California's path to decarbonizing uh, vehicles, to moving to electric vehicles. I'm simplifying this. We have to simplify this. There's a thousand second order considerations in all these, all these things. You, you, you wait till you win the first order battles before you dig into all the second order ones. Let me mention one more. If you put an electric heat pump on your house to heat it and cool it, an electric heat pump gives you four units of heat for every unit of electricity you put in. They're, they're absolutely amazing. And they've, they've really gotten better in recent years. If you, next time you need a furnace, you replace it one that's an electric heat pump instead of a natural gas furnace. And we do this at the rate of turnover of furnaces, which is about 12 years. Um, then you have a zero carbon, and you have a clean grid, then you have a clean building. And who does that? It's the people that write and set building codes. In almost every state, that's either the state legislature or sometimes the county. So if you want to electrify buildings, you need a good building code. It's that simple. And the decision maker is one that's rarely targeted by environmental groups. But if we fail to target those decision makers in their forms, in their language, with sound economic and sound technical arguments, we lose. On the other hand, if we do that, if we have that precision intervention, we can put mighty force behind it. We can concentrate, we can emphasize, we can strategize. We can bring in allies, we can bring in healthcare workers, we can bring in um, the public safety experts, we can bring in the economists, and we can win those battles one by one by one. And we can do, we can, between us in this room, between us in this, in this beautiful valley, between us in this world, we can have those four battles running all at the same time and we can win most of them. We can't do it if we don't aim carefully. We can't do it if we don't concentrate our forces on the most important decisions. When it comes to solutions, I'd love for us to dig into a debate or maybe settle one. Do we have all the technology that we need? I would say we have enough to get 70 to 80% of the way there. Um, and if we deploy that quickly, it buys time to develop the technologies we don't yet have. We should invest in R&D heavily, because there are some tough problems with industry being atop the pile. Um, but if we wait until somebody has the perfect nuclear reactor or the, the perfect anything, then we are, we are destined to lose. And so on that invention, right, we invented solar here, Bell Labs. The lithium ion battery was invented by ExxonMobil, believe it or not. But we don't own those industries, Hal. Like, we're in the world of venture capital. John and team put money in these solar companies. What happened? Well, America doesn't like the words industrial policy. And so with some important exceptions, we haven't done a great job. When we put our mind to do something, we have the best universities in the world by far, by just a huge distance. We have the best pharmaceuticals, we have the best uh, software, we have some of the most important creative forces in the world. Uh, the interstate highway system was an expression of a, you can love it or hate it, but it was an expression of a strategic intent. We have not done that with, with clean energy yet. Um, and it's a horrible failure. China's doing it, and thank God they're doing it. I don't want China to beat America. I don't want America to beat China. I want us to engage in a strategic competition to lower the cost of saving the earth. 
right? We, and we can't let anything else blind us from that necessity. John, you're on the other end of that checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have the technologies we need to get halfway there. Mm -hmm. um, I consider cost reduction to be technology innovation of the highest order. I worship at that altar of innovation. Um, but I think our obstacles are more deployment. They are siting. They are permitting. Uh, Hal has a story to tell about the deployment of renewable energy here in Colorado that I think is illustrative for the world at large. Yeah. So the, the windiest place in the continental United States is eastern Wyoming. It's pretty desolate, too, to be fair to our friends up north. Um, and there's an oil man named Phil Anschutz, who's a multi-billionaire. Uh, he's an oil and gas guy. He's very conservative. He lives in Colorado. But he decided to put in the biggest wind farm in America in eastern Wyoming. And he first, the first thing that the Wyoming legislature did is they tried to pass a wind tax of two cents a kilowatt hour, and I'm not making that up. They got over that. They had some pretty good governors. Um, the previous and current governors wanted this to happen. Um, in order to get that electricity to market, Anschutz had to build a transmission line that goes from eastern Wyoming down to Las Vegas, where the inner ties are. Um, so he got his landman, which is an oil and gas term, the guy that figures out where to drill, to uh, his best landman to assemble the permits necessary to build the biggest wind farm in America and the transmission line to take it to markets. That was 12 years ago. They have spent more than $100 million trying to get these permits, and they haven't broken ground yet. So that's a recipe for losing, right? I'm not against softening. I am against softening environmental requirements. I'm not against, let me start over. Why you streamline it? <laughs> we should not soften environmental requirements, but projects that meet them and meet them well should have permits very rapidly. If we fail to designate some zones as okay for renewables or okay for transmission lines along an interstate highway or what have you, we lose. And so you can't be an environmentalist in the sense of saving the entire earth unless you begin to think about deployment. And there are some tough questions. It doesn't mean you should build everywhere, but you have to find enough places. The German government did something really interesting, which we should watch closely. They told every state to allocate 2% of their land for clean energy. Go. So we're going to see how that turns out. Let's talk about Europe. And after this question, I am going to open it up to the audience, because I, I do want, truly in a deep dive fashion, if there's an area you want to learn more from, from John and Hal or a question, let's dig into it. This global energy security crisis that we're in, this war that's been going on now for four months, I'd love to hear both of your perspectives on it. We're funding both sides of this war. This, uh, Bad set of strategic choices that are dependence on fossil fuels from un unstable and host hostile regions. Putin's making more money now with sanctions in place than he was before the war was started. And our friends in China and India are gladly buying his oil at lower prices than they would have otherwise. So the road to a new clean energy future, we would like to be as smooth as possible. But it's a revolution, and in revolutions, real revolutions, there's winners and there are losers, and it's going to be a bumpy road. Uh, we should not use the energy crisis as an excuse to drill for more fossil fuels. We don't need any more. In fact, we can't afford to burn the ones that we have. That's what the IEA, an independent agency, has concluded. But we can use this energy crisis as a way to take the resources that we have developed, liquefy more natural gas, allow the German economy to go forward while we invest like crazy in the deployment siting of renewables. You see it that way, Hal? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes when you are woken by your alarm clock and you're still sleepy, you push that little button that gives you nine more minutes. We've been pushing that button for 50 years, right? We've had two oil crises. We've had oil price shocks. 
We've despoiled land left, right, and center. We've tallied up the tons, as we've illustrated. We've used up most of our carbon budget. And we've had these national security problems. You know, we fund both sides of the war on terror. There's a book written by a CIA agent back in the 80s called Who Funds Terror? And the answer is us at the gas pump, right? So when are we going to effing grow up and deal with this problem? And I think the answer has to be now. And so it's a fascinating story that's unfolding in Europe right now because they have a new government. The Greens are in government for the first time. They're part of a three-party coalition. And they ran on a really aggressive, really intelligent, highly detailed plan to decarbonize the German economy and to, do a, and to, and to go far in Europe, too. They were required by law 65% reductions by 2030 compared to 1990, and 55% for Europe as a whole. And then they get whacked on the head with this Russian war on the Ukraine. Um, and, and it reminds us all that energy is a national security problem. It has been all along. We just put that, kept hitting that snooze button. So right now, Germany is faced with um, a choice which I'm going to exaggerate as a dichotomy, which is clean or dirty. And nobody is going to stay in power if they let the lights go out. So the way you have to answer that question if you want clean is to prove, to show that you can make a more reliable grid by reducing your dependence on petroleum, on natural gas and oil. One would think with Putin holding up blackmail cards against the United States that we would make that choice pretty easily, or against Germany, that they would make that choice pretty easily. I'm convinced it's gonna come out fine. Um, I'm convinced that, uh, first of all, if you want to do something quickly, you have to go with clean energy because it's much faster to build than a new power plant or a new liquid natural gas terminal. But this requires political courage in this space um, that we have not yet seen. I would say we're, the, the, the G7 is meeting tomorrow as we speak, and this is on top of their agenda, is what is the energy, their global energy strategy. It requires political courage, but it's very hard for political leaders to get ahead of their people. And that's why in the elements of this plan that deal with turning movements into action, we explicitly call for campaigns in the 20 largest emitting regions of the world to make climate a top two issue. Top two voting issue if they happen to have elections, but a top two issue. Climate is not a top two issue in the United States, despite the wildfires, the flooding, the calamities which we will experience more of. It's not a top two issue in China. It's not a top two issue in, uh, in, in India. So turn to your speed and scale plan, 8.1. When Greta Thunberg stood up in 20, it was 2019, I think, she was a lone teenager striking before the Swedish parliament on Friday, skipping school. A year later, she'd mobilized a million other youth in the largest turnouts in 100 or so cities. And she moved climate measurably as a top two issue in seven of the 20 economies. And Europe, as a consequence, went green. So yes, I can sit here and say I'm in favor of civil disobedience and youth action, and that gives me great hope it does. But we need to translate it into raw political governmental power as measured by, is this a top issue or not? I believe it will be. Thank you, John. Thank you, Hal. Mike's, ah, perfect. Right here. Or actually up in the back, go for it. Okay, um, I'm Abigail Wall, I'm a Bezos scholar, and I'm 17 years old. I've noticed that a popular talking point against electric vehicles is that disposing of their batteries is also toxic, so how do we address those concerns? There you go. You go. It's, a, it's a great point. Um, uh, there's many, many kinds of batteries, many battery chemistries. The old ones had lead in them, lots of it, and it got into the environment. Um, Lithium ion, there are supply issues with lithium. There are ways to, do, there are ways to extract lithium that are quite clean. But it, it becomes a strategic reserve. There are a lot of new battery chemistries being developed. It's back to this invent, if you, if you wanna, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. <laughs> the um, second best way is to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we need to be able to, we need these new battery chemistries that, are, that have incredibly high energy densities but are not filled with poisons or don't have a, a clean up supply. There's also a, a new industry of borning 
to deal with the old batteries. And you can use them, uh, a battery that's not good enough for a car because you've used it for 12 years, you can use it in, to back up the power grid for another dozen years, and then you can recycle what's inside of it. Um, so there's, there's some very well-known entrepreneurs who have put a lot of money and time and thought into, into this exact question. You're, you're right to raise it. It's what we need to get right. The chief engineer of Tesla, J.B. Straubel, has a company described in the book, Redwood Materials. It's in the business of recycling these batteries. The market for battery innovation and recycling is enormous. It's $700 billion per year. It's the mother of all markets. Whoever the next mic is. Yeah, if folks can just keep handing out the mics, I'll go to whoever has it next. Yes, go for it. Hi. Um, as you are trying to motivate um, political action and that political courage and making climate a top two point, um, as you're talking to people elsewhere in the United States, among BRIC nations, I haven't heard much about how you're tailoring your messaging through a, a cross-cultural lens to elicit that motivation. I'm going to direct that question to Ryan. <laughs> you know, we had this big debate with when crafting the OKRs, right? We would take them around the world over Zoom. It was during COVID. That was actually perhaps a blessing in disguise. This exercise actually started out of how do we spend our time tackling this crisis? And it turned out to be what speed and scale is. But the message that we give to the developed world is so different to the developing world. You'll see this little asterisk next to things like when we expect them to shut down coal and gas, when we expect them to put some of these clean energy standards, and there is a five to 10 year gap that we have to give them, right? It is very unfair for anyone on this stage to go to a country that has spent 30% energy security and say, hey, you should kind of buy all the clean green stuff. I know we've burned it all over here, but you should make that leap. And so the message we put in the book is as the US, as Europe, we've got to go first. We've got to make those technologies cheap enough that other countries can then leapfrog. You know, the case can be made today that if you're going to build a coal or gas plant, it actually is more expensive than solar and wind. Add storage, we still got a little bit more to go, but there were people on these stages five years ago, 15 years ago, that we're wishing for a future that we're in right now. And we're actually in the middle of it where the cleaner, greener thing is becoming cheaper. And so that, that's at least how we tailor the message is that let's, let's move quicker here. I've, uh, since I have a mic in my hand, I guess I'll take the initiative. Uh, thanks for speaking today. My name is Josh Adler. I'm the CEO of an energy intelligence company in Houston. And I find at the uh, many Aspen events I go to, I'm often the rare uh, ambassador, at least in part, from uh, the fossil fuels industry in as much as uh, many of those companies are my customers. And uh, the, I want to get at a key point that Hal brought up uh, in describing the uh, Anschutz, the problems building a huge wind project, because I think Hal, you, um, you've been very specific um, and, and strategic in how policy can be influenced at the level of um, uh, uh, moving the, the power system toward uh, a, uh, a cleaner or you know, more climate-friendly future. But it's, it, uh, it seems to me that uh, the, one of the chief challenges here is the um, opposition that has developed uh, almost uh, culturally to development and investment in big projects, the ability to build big things in the United States. You mentioned the, the gigawatts of power going in in China where they can just build stuff. Uh, but in the United States, the same problems with building, say, petroleum pipelines uh, and mines, that's become a real problem as far as the amount of uh, rare earths mining and lithium mining that will have to be built at an exponential pace in North America, construction of the electric grid to a massive level beyond what it's been, the need for hydrogen and carbon pipelines that will need to be built all over the country, carbon capture and storage wells, as well as the obvious offshore wind projects that are often opposed by the same people who also oppose fossil fuel development and, uh, and onshore solar and wind development. And so it seems to me that a key element that has gone largely unaddressed in the discussion today is most of the technology is there, maybe some of the policy interests are there, but how do we overcome the problem of building big things in America when there's become a culture of opposition and kind of nimbyism to constructing big things of any type, even when those things are climate-friendly projects? How that seems like that? the bottleneck here. Sure. Don't take a swing at that. So first of all, you're, you're dead on with your, your question. Um, 
and there, this is not an easy one to answer, but I would start with a few straightforward steps. First of all, states, because this is, or the feds, should pre-zone lands for clean energy deployment. They should say red, yellow, or green. Red, never going to happen. It's a wilderness study area. Stay away. Green, if you meet this, these standards, and they're tough, but they're, they're described in advance. If you meet those standards, you get a permit in 90 days. In yellow, we go to war. Right now, everything's yellow, right? So pre-zone. And there's plenty of places in America to cite renewable energy. There will be somebody in opposition, but it can be done. Um, the, the, the second thing I would argue is that states should, and the federal government should both employ an ombudsman for clean energy, whose job it is, and if you need to get 40 or 50 permits from seven different agencies, that's not, and California is as riddled with this, these regulations as anybody else. If, if, if that's the tableau you create, then we're not gonna deploy very much clean energy. So the ombudsman should be empowered to have the governor's voice to clean it up and to consolidate. It costs twice as much to put solar on your roof in America as it does in Germany. And the entire difference is soft costs. It's a one-page application in Germany. I've been through this process several times in the US. It's, it's an ordeal. So, so this is uncomfortable territory for a lot of environmentalists. Um, but you have to make you have to find the best pathway. It's not the perfect pathway. It's the best pathway. Thank you, Hal. I'm going to do quick, rapid. Whoever has the next mic, ask it quick. Sure. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm from San Diego. And I know you've talked a lot about California. And I agree that we've made some great headway. But this, um, this week, we just had a um, public meeting of the California Air Resources Board on their new scoping plan. It took two days because there were 450 public comments. So people are very engaged. And the upshoot of their plan, what I've got out of it so far, is that we're not going to make net neutrality by 4025 because there's so many obstacles um, going on. Uh, part of that, yes, we have great legislation. We don't have enforcement mechanisms or the people to do it. Uh, you need to replace all of these um, alternative, all of like the fossil fuel energy sources with other kinds of energy. And we almost give away solar panels in San Diego. But our, we have a lot of hydrogen electric and we're struggling because of the drought to generate enough electricity because we don't have the water now. So if California is struggling and they're right out there at the beginning, what kind of hope do we have for the rest of the country? Hal, I'm going to pick on you. California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you guys both live in California. And I was born and raised here in Aspen. So, <laughs> so f first of all, take heart that you're having a debate about how to get there, not whether to get there, right? Um, and San Diego's tough. Um, look at what happened, what UC San Diego did. The 50,000 person campus that's gone carbon, climate neutral. Um, so there are some examples there. I, I guess, I, and I'm heartened that there were 450 public comments. You know, that's, that's democracy doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, really all I can say is, is persist, right? The, the, the California requirements for cleaning up for carbon dioxide emissions are the strictest in the world of any large industrial nation, and I think of California as a large industrial nation, um, uh, and they're going to have some hard spots along the way, so persevere. I want to close with a thought that's haunted me ever since I wrote this book with help, amazing help from Ryan and from Hal. And you know, the, the old adage is that we inherit the earth from our ancestors. And somehow that always felt not quite satisfying. And it wasn't until someone said, after reading the book, she said to me, you know, John, it's not that we inherit this earth from our ancestors. We're borrowing it from our children. Uh, quick question. Um, I attended Project Drawdown about three years ago. And just as a concerned citizen, I don't work in, in, in the industry, and, and two things that came up in that that I walked away with were refrigeration mm -hmm. as being one big thing and you know, educating women and girls and giving them the choice and family planning, low on that this week. Um, just wondering if you might comment on that. 
I think the most exciting and hopeful of these key results are the ones that address turning movement into action. I refer you to big, hairy-ass objective number eight. The one that inspires me the most was inspired by Drawdown 8.4, that the world achieve universal primary and secondary education by 2040. You could say, John Doerr, you're crazy. What is that doing in a climate plan? But Drawdown and the entrepreneur who we've interviewed demonstrate the data shows that this goal, education equity, really means educating girls. And when we educate girls, we do more to solve the climate crisis than any other action of all of these. Marine Paul Jobs put it in the most moving way to close the book. She said, John, we should look on the climate crisis as the greatest opportunity humankind has ever received, the chance for us to redress a lot of wrongs get this world right. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we're, um, we're going to be actually up here for quite some time to help take more questions, but I am getting the, the, the little hook. Oh, do I have 10 more minutes? Oh, my God, amazing. Okay, can we get some mics up in the front? I've got three people looking at me like, how dare you not? Okay, we'll first do the two in the back, and then uh, the gray and the green, and then in the blue. I'm holding a mic, so if yeah. you don't mind, I'll go ahead. Could you please address the role of voluntary carbon offset projects? Oh, yeah. Providing an existing funding mechanism for carbon emission reductions, capture, et cetera. Yeah, the, the term offset is so overloaded right now, right? You have companies that are able to put on marketing material that we are carbon neutral, and all they're doing is paying someone else in another part of the world not to emit. And I think part of the work that we're doing right now and what you're actually seeing from the carbon market community is that we can't use this lump term anymore. There's, off, there's, sorry, there's credits that are towards removal, there's credits towards avoidance, and then protecting nature. And we do have to find a way to support those three independently. Companies should only be able to buy the removal ones for their net zero math. And then out of the goodness of just community, they should be buying the other two. So that's one point of view. Our tracker, for the record, only counts companies, Fortune 500 companies, that have committed in writing to scope three reductions. It's very aggressive, and I think it's only like 4%. Yeah, it's a... Uh, Fortune 500. But you can find that on the website now, and I think it'll kick up something of a storm tomorrow on Squawk Box. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Greg Hammer here from Miami. I've been coming to this Aspen Ideas Festival for over a decade, uh, dedicated my life work to doing what I can to save what's left. And uh, first of all, John, I was heartened by the title of your book, which will come clear in a moment because I've been saying it so much in the pitch I've been making for years and years since promoting a similar talk five years ago, 2017, yep. in the Door Hoosier, in fact, <laughs> uh, on pricing carbon, the carbon dividends plan. And so it's clear and you've confirmed it. And I've been saying it myself. I'm glad to hear it even today. We don't have a science problem. And we don't have a, a problem with solutions for the most part. 80%, they're in the can ready to go. They don't scale. And one thing that I've, I've listened to the chapter three times already, twice yesterday while riding the bike in the mountains. I'm going up struggler. <laughs> um, 7.3. We haven't had enough talk about the fact that it doesn't make financial sense for market actors to divert trillions in capital away from extraction and combustion of dead dinosaurs and ferns, I know, uh, and, and, and put it into catapulting the existing solutions and giving a reason for investors to invest in innovations. They're not going to invest when they know it's going to be undercut by artificially cheap fossil fuels. That's important. And since Hal and I met in 2015, months later was the Paris Agreement. Since the Paris Agreement, 60 of the world's largest banks have invested over $4.5 trillion into fossil fuels, legally breaking no rules, playing the game as designed. If we don't fix the rules, all the solutions are not going to go anywhere. Do you agree, and can you explain more about 7.3, why we need a price on carbon? Otherwise, this is not going to scale. We need to scale these solutions at the speed and scale needed to avert disaster. And this just doesn't make financial sense without making it more expensive, which is why Europe is kicking our ass and why they have a carbon border adjustment. Let's hope we can say, we're not going to lead on this. Let's hope we can muster the sanity to follow with a carbon border adjustment. Well, our ambition is to get a global price on carbon, a global price on carbon. And 7.3 is for $55 a ton, rising 5% annually. And I'll be the second to tell you that we've got to make 
the right outcome, the profitable outcome. So it's the probable outcome. If we don't figure out how to use and marshal market forces among the many levers to get this job done, the job will not get done. Al Harvey was the first to teach me that a price on carbon is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. It's not enough on its own to get us to where we need to go. But I, I believe before, sooner or later, there'll be a national price on carbon. There's a fairly effective market right now in Europe, and we've got more work to do there. So as for subsidies, we simply call for ending all the direct and indirect subsidies to fossil fuel companies and for harmful agricultural processes. How did you want to add anything or next question? Do you have a mic? J just one sentence. I do some work for a Midwestern bank, which is a pretty fair-sized institution. It's based in Ohio. It's conservative. They financed so far $8 billion worth of solar and zero on energy. And it's because it's risk-reward. Uh, risk zero on fossil fuel energy. Zero on fossil energy, sorry. It's, it's there, the risks, just, just think, consider one element. If you require fossil extractors to um, bond reclamation before they put a shovel in the ground, it's going to change their business model radically. And why shouldn't we do that? We do that in every other aspect of, of human commerce. <laughs> well, I, I hope they keep growing. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Alessandra Rufino, I'm from Brazil, and I work with activists there on the sort of movement part of this. Um, Brazil is sitting on top of a climate bomb, right? We have, you said, one gigaton was 7 million acres of forest. Mm -hmm. The Amazon rainforest has 1.5 billion acres of rainforest that are currently under threat. We don't know when we're going to reach a tipping point, but we might be really close to that, and we might lose it, right? And my question is, we've, been, we've seen a lot of violence in the Amazon particularly against activists that are trying to protect it with their own bodies, with their own lives. I work with youth activists all over Brazil, and a few of them are under threat. A few of them have, have, have had family members killed. It's real. It's the, the war is happening right there at the front lines. And what can we do? What can we do to protect? I, something that John said really resonated with me, that there will be losers in this revolution. Any real, real revolution does. The losers are really acting out, and they're killing us. What can we do? To protect the people that are trying to protect us. I don't have an answer. Can I get your email address and get back to you after I've spoken to people smarter than me? There's a point that how you make in the big fix, and it's also a point that's come from some of these carbon offset conversations, right? Can we pay for, you know, deforestation to stop? And the answer is weirdly no, because it creates weird imbalances that bad guys seem to find a way to still keep taking that kind of money, and you really put it on the national level. Like, truly, protection of forests and land have to be a national issue. Like, whenever I hear about Brazil, like, for, for fun facts, it's like 66% of their energy is from hydro. Yes. I think they have, like, 12% of its fossil fuels. They are the greenest country on the planet when it comes to... The, and the part where they end up being culprit number 12 or 18 is because of deforestation and the vehicles that move around. Like, Brazil could truly be the greenest country in the world. And, um, yeah. Vote for Lula. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Two. One more question, yes. Oh, hi, Kitty. Okay, I get to ask a question. And then I gotta make a statement, but, because um, we're gonna have to end. The Supreme Court's going to do it again this week, we know, right? They're going to cut down the ban on, in New York on emissions, and which is going to have potentially catastrophic effect on the EPA. I just wonder what, if you, what you see as that decision, where do we go from there? Okay, I'll start. I think we've got to get uh, federal legislation, which has been extraordinarily elusive on climate passed. We've got to get an ITC bill that Manchin and the Democratic majority of 50 plus one senators will support. What the Supreme Court decides about the EPA's powers to implement those laws, I don't know. We'll have to see what that, what that ruling is. I do take comfort from what Hal says, which is a lot of the action is at the state level. And I'll frame your question as being a question about the U.S., not a question about China or India or other parts of the world. Yeah. I think we're going to have to end, but I, I just want to take a moment because we have two people in this room who have just committed such a significant gift 
Ann Dorr and John Dorr to Stanford University, $1.2 billion to start the School of Sustainability, and all I can do to thank you both is to have us applaud because you walk the talk. Thank you so much. For that. Thank you.